Hello, and welcome to another slightly belated Talking Till Dawn. I'm Martin, and I'm here with what will I call you this time? Uh, did I did I see someone call you King of Campfire over on Twitter, Mike? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll use that. The King of Campfire, Michael Whitehouse. <laughs> How have you been? How have you been, Mike? I am. Um, I'm good. I'm good. I'm so sorry it's taken us so long to get another one of these episodes out, but we are research addicts, and it yeah. just it's things got in the way. This was a research heavy episode as well. Yeah. I'm the same with the one I'm I'm researching at the moment as well, and it's sometimes these things become a rabbit hole. I think some topics we're going to be able to do relatively quickly. Mm-hmm. Others, I think we've just happened to have both been researching two episodes with a lot of documentation to them and things, and that's that's just kind of slowed things up. But also, I've been sort of messing around with my schedule at the moment. But hopefully, things will be more regular now. Yeah. Do you know what I have been doing though? What? Speaking of going down rabbit holes, as I have been... I, Ferreting. I, yeah, oh God, no. Do you know what giant hogweed is? Oh yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's the stuff that grows by rivers and it's kind of toxic and it's, yeah. It's not kind of toxic. If you get the sap from this plant on your skin, the UV from the sunlight reacts with it and mm-hmm. you're basically, you get hospitalised with it because the burns are so bad and they're, they're these really insidious chemical burns. Yeah. So like they stick, and if you get them in your eye, you basically go blind. <laughs> so I've been finding out as a as a, a father now of a little two and a half year old girl who loves running around the grass and uh, loves nature. And we went for a walk the other day around like a sort of public loch, and tons of people going back and forward, kids on their bikes, everything. And there we are. Lo and behold, a massive giant hogweed plant. It looks very much like a plant that people call cow's parsley in Scotland. But it's a giant, much bigger version of it. Yeah, yeah. This was like six foot tall. They are for kids to play with. So come to Scotland, everyone. Yeah, it's dangerous, dangerous. Yeah. So that was uh, Talking Till Dawn about giant hogweed. We hope you guys have enjoyed it. Great to be back on the air. There's a hilarious video on YouTube of a Scottish guy going around identifying giant hogweed on one end of the car park. There's all this giant hog gene. He's like, phones the council. He's like, this stuff's really, really dangerous. Mm -hmm. And they turn up to cut down that stuff and instead they cut down plants at the other end of the car park. (laughs) (laughs) They've got nothing to do with it. Uh, So, there you go. Well, it's good. It's good you've been able to be getting back out and stuff. We took a drive out to Tensmuir Forest over by Dundee at the weekend. All right. Just being outside. The weather was nice. Went for like a walk in the woods. We saw some dolphins out in the firth. Oh, nice. just I thought you I thought you guys saw some dolphins in the in woods. The woods. <laughs> well, it's right down. It's right down on the the firth of Tay. Right. So I mean, I mean, I've been relatively lucky with where I live. There's a lot of paths and water and green spaces to to get out for some socially distanced exercise. But to be somewhere like totally unfamiliar for the first time in months and feel immersed in the outdoors. Yeah. yeah it was, it was wild. I mean, it was a sleepy Sunday drive and we had a wee walk in the woods, but it was about as wild as my life's been for a while. Yeah. One thing, though, that I know a lot of folk have been doing during lockdown, aside from 24-hour homeschooling, fighting with your spouse, maybe, I guess working your arse off if you're a key worker, but I know one small silver lining is some lucky ducks with nothing better to do have been using it to catch up on some reading. Yes. This sounds like this is about to be an advert. It's not. I'm not. I'm not working on commercial. But <laughs> Audible, everyone. Why read? Yeah. When you can listen. Early on in lockdown, I read an old, old short story written by Arthur Conan Doyle called "The Horror of the Heights." Yeah. Possibly you've read it, Mike. Yeah, I know the I know the story. Yeah. But that's what gave me the idea of this topic. The idea the story hinges on struck me as both totally crazy and weirdly plausible. And I I wanted to try and find out if there was even a chance of there being some tiny seed of truth to the idea behind that story. Now, Horror of the Heights concerns an aviator in the 1910s investigating the unexplained deaths of aircraft pilots competing to beat the altitude record from the same airfield in Wiltshire. The hero of the story manages to ascend to 40,000 feet, which at the time the story was written was about 10,000 feet higher than had been attained and he discovers at this fantastic suffocating height that far above the English countryside exists an entire ecosystem of vaporous gelatinous creatures hanging in the air gas-filled balloon jellyfish 
floating amoeba-like cloud forms and a bizarre carnivorous animal in the form of a kind of transparent amorphous blob with grasping tentacles and hungry jaws which naturally has developed a taste for pilots. In the story the protagonist refers to these clusters of airborne life forms as air jungles and he suggests that lots of these might exist around the world that just as there are different ecosystems at different depths of the sea a similar pattern might be seen across the different layers of the atmosphere and that mankind in his conquest of the air which was a new thing then obviously was expanding into a new and potentially dangerous habitat where he was no longer the apex predator now horror of the heights is a work of fiction of course it was first published in the strand magazine in 1913 a time when aviation or powered heavier than air aviation was very much in its infancy this was before aircraft had been widely used in warfare before the first scheduled passenger flights very few people had been on a plane aviation was still a source of wonder and whimsy and astonishment to people such ideas strange beings living just out of reach overhead must have seemed then at least a possibility 40,000 feet is only 10 kilometers seven and a half miles roughly that's about the distance between me and you right now mike it's a pretty big cabin everyone (laughs) (laughs) it's a long cabin that might as well have been the far side of the moon to your man or woman on the street back then a far off exotic unattainable place today things are obviously different most people in the Western world will fly on an airliner at some point in their lives at 38, 40,000 feet. Lots do it every year, several times a year, even more than that. Some business jets fly at 50,000 feet. Concord, when it was running, flew at 60,000. You know, we've seen the Earth photographed from space. There's satellites looking down, radar looking up. There's much less of a sense of mystery about the heights above us. And yet, as I found out, Up to this very day, and stretching back centuries actually, and it doesn't get the same amount of tabloid press coverage as flying saucers or Bigfoot, but there are persistent reports of sightings of a huge variety of strange airborne life forms, of people claiming to have captured photographs of these creatures, even cases of people allegedly being attacked by these creatures. And just to be clear, we're not talking about avian cryptids like Thunderbird or modern-day pterodactyls or even boogeymen like Mothman. We're talking about more bizarre, gelatinous or vaporous things. (laughs) More like, I don't know, the kind of thing you'd expect to see under a microscope or bobbing around a rock pool than floating in the sky. A phenomena, or a range of phenomena, that in many of these cases seem to straddle the line between cryptozoology and ufology. A lot of these cases involve the sighting of an unidentified object in the sky, but instead of looking like a vehicle or a machine, this object has the appearance and behaviour of an anomalous living organism. So tonight we're going to explore just a few of these cases. Are they aliens? Are they interdimensional beings? Are they, as in the Conan Doyle story, native earth life that has just eluded science so far let's kick things off with an encounter with a little thing i like to call the pennsylvania purple blob we're starting out strong mate. can i have that on a t-shirt you you can yeah you can have a purple blob on a t-shirt if you like if i eat any more food i'm going to be a purple blob <laughs> it's september 27th 1950 and on the front page of the philadelphia inquirer not emblazoned across the top but Tucked away at the bottom of the front page, the bizarre headline, Flying Saucer Just Dissolves. The previous night, about 10pm, police officers Joseph Keenan and John Collins were patrolling in a squad car on Vare Boulevard in South Philadelphia when they spotted something unfamiliar in the sky. It looked like a parachute. That's what they thought it was at first. And indeed, it appeared to be falling towards the ground very gently, lazily, just kind of drifting through the air at about treetop height. The police officers followed this object on its descent and tracked it to a field near 26th Street where it came to rest on the ground. 
I had a look at this area on Google Maps and it's a pretty well built up area of the city today. But I'm assuming in 1950 this was Greenbelt or maybe a brownfield site. 26th Street is still there, Ver Boulevard seems to be gone. So I think this area has been pretty much redeveloped since then. But anyway, this is during the, the, sorry, the Korean War, not the Vietnam War. Most people on the force, I assume including patrolmen Collins and Keenan, would have been war veterans themselves. World War II was still fresh in everyone's minds. It had only been over for less time than than it had lasted. So when these guys see what they believe to be a parachute coming to Earth, they're not thinking, oh, that's a novelty. They're thinking this could be a very serious incident indeed. They get on the radio and they call in backup. So another car arrives. In it, patrolman James Casper and a sergeant Joseph Cook. Well, that's an unfortunate name when you're when you're encountering something that's truly bizarre. Cook. Oh, Cook. I thought you were going to say Casper because it's a spooky thing. <laughs> the other guy was James Casper. There you go. Both of them. <laughs> no, but it's like C O O K. Right. Not like K O O K. So the four officers enter the field to investigate this supposed parachute. Now. I, I thought maybe they would be thinking about a North Korean spy, maybe, because they're at war with Korea at this point. I guess some fears never change. I don't think any of them expected what they did discover. The thing on the grass was no parachute. It was a thick disc of jelly-like material, about six feet in diameter and so light in terms of weight that it barely bent the weeds that it lay spread out on. When they shone their flashlights on it, the object diffused the light that passed through it into a hazy purple glow. And on close inspection, the material appeared to have tiny crystals suspended in it. There's no photos, but I I picture it looking a bit like, um, you know the kind of bling kitchen worktops or flooring tiles that some people have? I think they look a wee bit naff sometimes, especially in some of the colours you see. But you you know the ones with a little mica crystal suspended in like a coloured resin? So you get that sparkle effect, yeah. like you get this black sparkle yeah, yeah. or green spark. you know. I, I think it reads as looking a little bit like that, like a purple sort of sparkly, it sounds really weird. Patrolman Collins attempted to lift the object from the ground, but the material just came apart in his hand, broke down into a tacky residue on his fingers. The remainder of the object, and this is weird, the remainder of the object continued to dissolve and evaporate before their very eyes until half an hour later there was nothing recognisable left. In some retellings, but not the original Inquirer piece, so this could be extra detail from an official report, or it could be an invented edition, so do treat this with some caution. But it's stated that the object, quote, quivered, and the officers made it plain that they felt the object was alive. Now, an interesting wrinkle to this, Mike, is that The date of the sighting almost coincided with another unusual aerial phenomena in the local area. This one witnessed across large swathes of the states of Pennsylvania, Northern Ohio, Michigan, as far as Chicago in Illinois. An almost forgotten event known as the Lavender Sun of 1950. (laughs) That's another band name, Michael. To me, that's like the perfect science fiction novel title from the 1950s yeah. the lavender sun just to j- just to interject for two seconds so i remember reading account i've never heard of the lavender sun thing i can't wait to hear about that but the case that you've just spoken about it's like the star jelly thing isn't it yeah we're, we're building to star jelly but yes absolutely building to star jelly. that's the lavender sun's first album <laughs> building to star jelly <laughs> that's definitely got to be our band name the <laughs> lavender sun yeah because it sounds so nice and we play lounge music. <laughs> <laughs> in the afternoon of Sunday 24th of September, so two days before the purple glob landed, millions of Americans witnessed the sky overhead darken inexplicably, and the sun begin to dim and shimmer in bizarre colours, with people in different areas reporting bursts of red, pink, purple, and blue, like some strange alien star birds stopped singing, streetlights came on at midday. Reactions to this ranged from amazement, curiosity, and a certain degree of mild panic. Some thought it was the result of a nuclear explosion. One guy called into the Bradford era to announce that Judgment Day had arrived 
But by mid-evening, the sky had begun to clear and by the next day, the sun was back to his old self. By the next day, he felt like an idiot. Unlike the purple glob though, this event seems to have had a straightforward meteorological explanation. A long and unusually dry summer in Canada had led to a vast number of wildfires. The smoke from these was spread high into the atmosphere over parts of the northern USA. And smoke on its own can cause changes in the sun's parent colour. You can see photos and videos of this online. You can get like blood red and hot pink midday skies. Is that why you get pink skies? Well, it's not the only reason. So you get pink skies at night when the sun's Mm. shining through like loads of atmosphere and all the dust and all the particles in the atmosphere there's like a scattering effect it's, it's just that but if a... you get pink skies when the sun's directly overhead yeah then something is thickening thickening what the light's having to come through something is it's being extra scattered you see what i mean yeah this is obviously something so strong that the effect persisted right until midday rather than being something that's um, only at only at like sunset and sunrise it's just that you know like i grew up on if it's not the highest point in glasgow city it's yeah one of the highest i think it probably is round about the highest point oh you've been up that street it looks over the entire city yeah and um you always get some really strange skies there and there's always been this very specific pinkish light that you get at a certain time and I've, uh-huh. I've seen pink skies elsewhere obviously but there I don't know why but there specifically it always makes me think that it looks almost fake it looks like mm. like uh, fake light yeah and that's when I realized I was in the Truman show anyway sorry <laughs> continue so in this case it wasn't just dust and and smoke in the upper atmosphere there was a drop in temperature, which meant that there was ice crystals involved as well. And you know how sometimes when there's a lot of ice crystals, you get things like halos and sun dogs and, and things, you get a lot of weird um, lighting effects. Well, this also contributed to the, the aerial bizarreness of the lavender sun. But it does raise the question, was there some cause and effect relationship between these two unusual events happening within such a short space of time? We might wonder... For example, letting our speculation run free for a moment. Always. If this blanket of smoke perhaps disturbed some fragile aerial habitat, causing some tenuous floating organism to to begin drifting into the lower atmosphere, you know, in its death throes as it dies, there could have been others as well, given that it seemed to break down when interacting with solid objects. A bit of slime on the ground wouldn't necessarily garner a closer look anyway, you know, without the act of having seen it land. With my more critical hat on though, there is another possible cause and effect between this purple blob and the brush fires. And that's the chance that this lilac sun event, which was a really big deal at the time, it shook a lot of people. It was still fresh in everyone's mind and these cops were maybe hyper attuned to anything strange in the sky as a result. You know, if you're you're thinking about a weird sky phenomena, which at that time probably hasn't yet been adequately explained. It's only a few days later, you see maybe a bit of plastic tarp blowing through the air, it looks a bit weird, you you see it fall near a field, and in that field you find some unrelated industrial sludge or something, you put two and two together and you make 15, right? That's a real possibility, I think, bearing in mind we only have these short newspaper reports, maybe some, maybe the, the original police reports still exist in some archive, but without knowing who had eyes on the object and when, where exactly were the gaps in the observation, it's hard to be certain that what they found in the field was definitely the same thing they saw falling through the air. However, one thing that does shed doubt on this seemingly more rational explanation, I managed to find the weather report for Philadelphia on the 26th of September 1950. You'll recall The blob made earthfall that day at about 10pm, according to the papers. Well, between 8 and 10pm that evening, I've discovered that the wind speed at Philadelphia dropped from 8 miles per hour to zero. When the officers saw this object drifting overhead, the air was completely still. So to my mind, those conditions are actually more conducive to this object being something that descended from height rather than something that's been momentarily cast aloft by a gust of wind. Mm. 
I suppose it could have been some sort of weird chemical condensate from a chimney somewhere, a smokestack. Philadelphia is an industrial city, there's several refineries in the area. But it's it's still a curious incident, quite low-key, it's not, it's not particularly dramatic. It didn't get a crazy amount of press, but a lot of people will tell you, in their opinion, the purple glob of Philadelphia is just one example of an encounter with a dead or dying atmospheric beast. And apparently, screenwriter and actress Kay Linketer saw this story in the press and was inspired to write a screenplay entitled The Molten Meteor. I was going to say The Blob. This script would be filmed in 1957 and the film was released in 1958 under the title The Blob with Steve McQueen in the lead. Yes, Steve McQueen. (laughs) But most interesting to me, as you suggested already, Mike, is that it may not be unique at all. In fact, you might choose to interpret the event as just one example of a phenomenon that has a very long history in the records and in literature. Swift as the shooting star that gilds the night, with rapid transient blaze she runs, she flies, sudden she stops, no longer can endure the painful course, but drooping sinks away, and like that falling meteor, there she lies, a jelly cold on earth. That was written in 1740 by English poet William Somerville in his poem Hobbinall or the Rural Games. It's part of a passage describing a smock race, which was a a traditional foot race run by young women at country fairs. And the heroine Gandretta, who at this point in the narrative has surged ahead of the pack only to stumble and fall behind. Okay, so, But the imagery at the end of the quote I gave there, and like that falling meteor, there she lies, a jelly cold on earth, isn't just some tortured mixed metaphor. It draws on what was at that time a widely held folkloric belief that some shooting stars would leave behind on the moonlit hills and meadows of the earth a strange celestial jelly. Lovecraftian, isn't it? Yeah, I love it. Cosmic horror. Yes, please. In fact, (laughs) do you know what? Yes, please in a fictional sense. No please to ancient elders or outer gods raining down from the sky on earth. Yeah, definitely. No thanks to that. But but, you know, I think think the, the star jelly legend is fairly harmless in and of itself. The weird thing is like the association between something as airy and otherworldly as a falling star or an apparent falling star and something as gross as a lump of goo. But it was it was definitely like a that was a fruitful source of literary inspiration. It's an image that's brought up in poetry and fiction with striking regularity between at least the 15th and the 19th centuries. In 1825, in Sir Walter Scott's The Talisman, Seek a fallen star, said the hermit, and thou shalt only light on some full jelly, which in shooting through the horizon has assumed for a moment an appearance of splendour. More matter of fact is this statement by philosopher Henry Moore in 1656, actually trying to explain it as a natural phenomenon of sorts. That the stars eat, that those falling stars, as some call them, which are found on the earth in the form of a trembling jelly, are their excrement, or meteor shit, to quote Stephen King. (laughs) Creep show, amazing. This phenomenon of so-called star jelly, or star shot, or star slubber, goes by many names in different places. Say that again. Star slubber. Ah, it's beautiful. It's a little bit too too erotic for for this this programme. (laughs) <laughs> uh, in Germany it's known slightly <laughs> slightly less attractively as Sternenrotz or Star Snot in Wales they call it Pudra Ser, the rot of the stars oh, that's, I like the rot of the stars but the Welsh word that you used Pudra Ser I thought you were just going to say the Welsh call it poo <laughs> <laughs> but this would indicate that both the star slime phenomenon and the folklore surrounding it are not limited to one small area. Some of the ways in which it's referenced in older writing make it seem almost commonplace. It appears in medieval medical manuals. John of Gaddesden, a doctor writing in the early 14th century, recommended Stella Terry, or Earth Star in Latin, a certain mucolaginous substance lying upon the earth, 
as a treatment for abscesses. So you've got to rub it on your gums. Now, while this astral jelly is strongly associated with meteors, with certain falling stars, we can be pretty certain that this cannot be true of meteorites as they're understood by modern science. That is, objects usually orbiting the sun that end up intersecting the earth in its orbit and crashing into the atmosphere. Meteorites are typically formed of silicate rock or iron nickel mixtures. They're very hard, dense objects and they have to be in order to survive the intense heat and friction and, and shock waves of re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere long enough to make it to the ground anyway. There have been those who have suggested, I seem to have misplaced my quotes for that, but I believe Charles Fort might be among them, that star jellies are actually a sort of gooey biological meteorite that as the Earth travels through interplanetary space. It sometimes crosses paths with like clouds of free-floating void life, clumps of cellular matter in the vacuum of space, which then enter our skies and fall to the ground. Cool idea, but unfortunately, the relative speed between the Earth and objects crossing its orbit is almost always going to be several kilometres per second. I think the slowest known meteorites that have been measured are about 10 or 12 kilometers per second and something soft like a jelly slapping into the atmosphere at that speed it's going to be vaporized instantly split second never mind surviving all the way to the ground and if somehow it wasn't traveling that fast relative to the earth which by the way is moving a thousand miles an hour on its own even if that was possible well then you wouldn't have the fiery tail or any of the visual things that we associate with falling stars so because you don't have the speed, you don't have the shockwave. So a space origin for these things is a non-starter in my opinion. It should be said though that star slime is still found today. There are a lot of reports, even right here in Scotland in recent years, of strange jelly being found on the ground where a shooting star has supposedly landed. There are lots of photographs of this stuff on the ground, there have been samples collected and interestingly, these have produced a variety of different results. In fact, TV presenter Chris Packham of Springwatch fame, don't know if you ever watched Springwatch, Mike? I know him well, yep. So, Chris Packham had a sample of star jelly analysed on a BBC programme called Nature's Weirdest Events in 2015. The jelly was tested for DNA at the London Natural History Museum and was shown to originate from a frog, mostly but it also contained magpie DNA, so this sample at least appears to have been a lump of half-digested frog spawn vomited back up by a bird. Oh, beautiful. Lovely image. It seems that some birds, it's going to get nastier, some birds and mammals will eat frogs and then regurgitate the contents of the oviducts, which are slimy and hard to digest, leaving behind these blobs of goo. Other samples have been shown to be colonies of slime moulds, which are a fascinating topic just on their own, but essentially they're clusters of single-celled organisms that can take on different properties and shapes depending on the environment. These are real-life bona fide shapeshifters. One minute they can be a blob on the ground, the next they disappear into the soil or break down into a dust to spread themselves on the wind. This could explain some of the discoveries where the mystery slime unexpectedly disintegrates or melts away. There's a type of cyanobacteria as well that's been implicated in several cases. In Dorset, in 2012, a strange bluish orbs of jelly that supposedly fell as rain in a guy's garden were analysed and discovered to be super absorbent sodium polyacrylate granules. Now, these are sold as a product by the name of Waterlock, the granules can absorb 300 times their own weight in liquid and as they do of course they swell up way beyond their usual size and take on a gloopy, blobby sort of consistency. You probably know it Mike most closely as the jelly stuff that's inside nappies and sanitary pads and uh... it's also used in agriculture and gardening as a water reservoir for tubs and hanging baskets and what seems to have happened is rain and hail fell on the garden and the moisture was absorbed by granules of this stuff that someone had spilled on the owner's grass and these granules were there without him knowing until they swelled up and became visible. So clearly star jelly or, or what is popularly referred to as star jelly 
is not one single phenomenon. There's certainly this persistent idea of meteorites falling in the form of a slime, and this, as a result, means that some people, having heard of the phenomena, see a fireball in the night sky, and then perhaps are primed to look for slimy objects on the ground where they think it's fallen. It bears mentioning that the meteors we can see in the sky, the actual bright flashes and streaks, are happening way up high, like above the stratosphere even, in the thermosphere and the mesosphere. And that's where the atmosphere becomes dense enough that friction causes these fast-moving objects to burn brightly. If anything is left of the rock, after this burn, which usually happens between 50 and 100 kilometers above the surface, so about 30 to 60 miles up. The buffeting air slams the brakes on it, basically. It begins to slow it down. It cools rapidly. It dims. It no longer glows. And it enters what's known in the meteor hunting trade as dark flight. That's a great And at this point, yeah, from about 30 miles altitude on down to the surface, It's basically just a stone falling through the air at terminal velocity, and it falls for several minutes. So while a so-called falling star can seem really close by, and people will say, oh, I saw it streak through the sky, and it came down just right behind those trees or two fields away, if the bright streak of light looks like it's coming down anywhere other than directly overhead, if you see it shoot towards the horizon and you think, hey, it must have landed just over there, in actual fact, If it didn't completely vaporise like the vast majority of objects, then there's a very good chance it's tens or hundreds of miles further away from where you think it is. So if star jelly can't be from outer space, and if most meteorites fall tens or hundreds of miles away from where witnesses expect them to, why am I even talking about them? And in any case, what does it have to do with atmospheric beasts? Well, and this is me stretching far into the speculative again, please don't interpret this as my actual belief on the subject, but I think it's at least worth raising in the context of this podcast. How did meteorites come to be associated with star jelly in the first place? What is the genesis of that connection? Bearing in mind that there are also, among all the varied explanations that have been found for various star jelly falls, there are occasional examples of this phenomenon that defy categorization. There have been samples tested where the results were puzzling or inconclusive. Is it remotely possible that some of the objects described in these cases as falling stars were not meteors burning in the high atmosphere, but much closer objects emitting a different kind of light? Bioluminescence, for example. And the fact that people usually misunderstand just how far away burning meteors are They're ignorant to the fact that real meteorites don't glow brightly all the way to the ground. Well, you could say that that cuts both ways, because people might genuinely see a glowing object land in their immediate vicinity and not be clued up enough to tell that that means it's likely not come from space. And they may refer to it as a meteor when it isn't. Couple that with the kind of imprecise language used in a lot of these accounts, especially the, the, the older ones, you know, The Philadelphia blob is one example where the officers seem to have followed it to the place it landed, where it has these weird properties of being incredibly light and having crystalline material within it, where there's... They saw it as a single object as well, did they not? Yes, exactly. It wasn't wasn't a bright bright light. They, They saw something that at least looked like the form they found on the ground in the sky. They could tell it was close by. They said it was at treetop height. And and there's also, with that story, there is at least some suggestion of phosphorescence, especially in how it behaved with the torches. But there are even more curious reports where similar objects having fallen from the sky were scientifically examined and found to have some kind of anatomy. My ears just pricked up. Yeah, it's, it's a weird one. In the Annual Register of 1861, page 687, you'll find the following account gelatinous meteor at Amherst in Massachusetts. On the 13th of August, 1819, between 8 and 9 o'clock in the evening, a fireball of the size of a large blown bladder and of a brilliant white light was seen in the atmosphere. It fell near a house and was examined by Rufus Graves Esquire, formerly lecturer of chemistry at Dartmouth College. It was of a circular form, resembling a solid dish, bottom upwards, about eight inches in diameter and about one in thickness, 
of a bright buff colour with a fine nap upon it, similar to that in milled cloth. On removing this nap, a buff coloured pulpy substance of the consistence of soft soap appeared, having an offensive suffocating smell, producing nausea and giddiness. After a few minutes exposure to the air, the buff colour was changed to a livid colour resembling venous blood. It attracted moisture readily from the air, a quantity of it in a tumbler soon liquefied and formed a mucilaginous substance of the consistence, colour and feeling of starch when prepared for domestic use. The tumbler was then set in a safe place where it remained undisturbed for two or three days and it was found to have all evaporated except for a small dark coloured residuum adhering to the bottom and sides of the glass, which when rubbed between the fingers produced about a thimbleful of a fine ash coloured powder without taste or smell. And more than anything, I love the fact he actually tasted a bit of it. Guts. That's guts, everyone. <laughs> or stupidity. Mm. So, was he a biologist? Yeah. A uh, so, chemist. chemist. A chemist. We see this all the time in science fiction movies where you have like a, a biologist as part of some expedition. I'm thinking more specifically about Prometheus, where they encounter some alien life and they do something really <laughs> daft. Like well, they lick it yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and take you their think, mask off. That's ridiculous. Biologists would not be doing yeah, that. But, be but microbes. Bear in mind that chemists, before sort of health and safety, smell and taste were like two of the generally catalogued things when someone was describing like a new compound. The first thing the chemistry teacher said to us in school was like, don't sniff anything, don't put anything in your mouth. But this was actually like part of the protocol back in the well, day. Well, that's just life not. advice, Martin. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But chemists had like a depending on what they were doing. I think a lot of them had a quite drastically reduced lifespan as a result of that. So yeah, I mean, it is pretty far-fetched, this idea. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to give the impression I'm particularly a believer in this theory. And it should be mentioned, this guy didn't say it was an animal. He just described it in very, very straightforwardly descriptive terms. He didn't say this was a creature, but it sounds like it's something that has some kind of anatomy. But the idea being that even allowing that most star jellies are just fungus or bird vomit or bits of frogs or whatever, that some instances of so-called star jelly are the dead or dying remains of tenuous living organisms that ordinarily inhabit the upper regions of the Earth's atmosphere, and that as they die, some of these organisms might brightly luminesce, just like many aquatic organisms glow and shimmer when in distress, and that this appearance of a light falling from the sky has on occasion deceived non-expert witnesses into misidentifying the object as a meteor or a falling star. And that this has led maybe to the connection, created the original connection between falling stars and jelly or slime in the first place. We love a good bit of speculation on this podcast. That yeah. doesn't sound as speculative as some of the things we've mentioned before. I mean, the only you, you you still I mean basically you fall foul of the same old camera phone problem. You'd see these things all the time, but then people see lights and film lights yeah. in the sky all the time, and they don't know what they are. So maybe well, exactly. At the very least, I think it's an interesting, sort of internally consistent, and yet quite honestly entertaining theory. <laughs> I think I think that entertainment value is higher than anything else. It would basically be analogous to like the marine snow that falls in the deep ocean, things dying above and sinking to the bottom, except the ocean teems with life and these things, if they existed, would probably be quite rare. It's the only way I can imagine star jelly having any kind of anomalous origin, quite frankly. I've spoken already about how it's just not possible for this stuff to have fallen from interplanetary space if it doesn't come from the ground or from animals, and I think it probably does, but if any of it does actually come from the sky, then I think the simplest way to explain that would be to say it has to originate from within the atmosphere. And you could go nuts with that idea. You're absolutely right. You know, the, the idea of bioluminescent sky creatures could be applied to a large chunk of UFO cases throughout history, like you say. How many UFO sightings are, are essentially just strange lights in the sky behaving strangely? You could apply it to stuff like the Phoenix Lights, STS-48 incident. Gulf Breeze sightings, although I think that's been debunked now. It could even explain the likes of the Foo Fighters. And for those who don't know, I'm not talking about Dave Grohl's band. The band, I don't know if you know, Mike, but yeah. it, it's named after a set of phenomena that were observed by pilots during World War II, both over Europe 
and the Pacific. Yeah, I'm all about that. So these were these were fiery red or orange orbs that would appear and follow Allied aircraft and were reported to toy with the planes, behaving as though they possessed intelligence or at least a sort of playful intent, dodging, diving through the sky, making breakneck turns, then just winking out when the pilots got too close. They were almost never described as a solid object, always just blobs or winking lights. At the same time, the objects were assumed to be a German secret weapon. They were reported as such in the New York Times and in Daily Telegraph. They were also known on the front lines as Kraut fireballs among the Allied Air Forces. Such was the belief that they were German in origin. However, come the end of the war, it emerged that the Germans and Japanese had been seeing the exact same thing and believed it to be an Allied weapon. Spooky shit, Mike. Oh yeah, definitely. I should say, recently I've been on a deep dive on UFOs again and I'm really at the point now where I think, I don't know what they are, but I, I think some of them are real. We'll do an episode on that. Yeah. Hold yeah. on to your tic Well, no, no, I, <laughs> absolutely. Literally tic tac. The name Foo Fighter, by the way, originally came from the comic strip character Smokey Stover, created by cartoonist Bill Holman. Bill Holman was born in Crawfordsville, Indiana, and Crawfordsville, Indiana is by sheer coincidence the very location of our next story. We've spent a lot of the episodes so far talking about supposed encounters with dead atmospheric beasts. I think it's time we talked about a living one, or an alleged sighting of a living one. On the 5th of September, 1891, it was reported in the Crawfordsville Journal that a pair of ice salesmen, I think I've finally found my vocation, Mike, cooler than an ice salesman on Disco Island, you know, no, maybe oh, not. Beautiful. For some reason, though, ice salesman is a legitimate job. I know because when I worked in nightclubs, I dealt with them. <laughs> the funny thing is, when you said that, ice salesman, my first reaction was... Well, people will buy anything. <laughs> yeah. you know, like, you know, people will buy ice. It's ridiculous. It's like, yeah, people do. People go and buy big bags of ice for parties. Yeah, yeah. Or when, as in our case, the ice machine breaks. Or it's 1891 and people don't have their own refrigerators. But it's a way to make money, Martin. Of course it is. Because you just... It's a job. So it's a way to make money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't mean that. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way. What I meant was in the clubs, some clubs would basically want the glasses absolutely filled, packed with ice. I watered down the drinks. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Not the spirit usually, but the even just the mixer. Like, you do that over a thousand drinks. Yeah. So these guys, maybe you know them from your days in the trade, Michael. <laughs> Marshall McIntyre and William Gray. Oh, right, Billy! <laughs> Aye. <laughs> We're at some stables on the outskirts of Crawfordsville at two o'clock in the morning on the 5th of September, 1891 hitching up a wagon ready to go and pick up that day's consignment of ice for delivery. That's pretty early doors. I think I might have to rethink that career change. I quote here from the Crawfordsville Journal account, which was printed later that same day. While standing in the alley back of the stable, Mr. McIntyre suddenly felt a strange sensation of awe and dread coming over him, and looking up he saw a horrible apparition approaching from the west. It was about three or four hundred feet in the air and most gruesome in aspect. It was about 18 feet long and eight feet wide and moved rapidly through the air by means of several pairs of side fins, which it worked most sturdily. It was pure white and had no definite shape or form, resembling somewhat a great white shroud fitted out with propelling fins. There was no tail or head visible, but there was one great flaming eye and a sort of wheezing, plaintive sound was emitted from a mouth which was invisible. It flapped like a flag in the winds as it came on and frequently gave a great squirm as though suffering unutterable agony. When it came to be directly over the residence of Mr. Martin, that was the owner of the stables, it began to sweep slowly and majestically around in a circle. It hovered thus for some time and the watchers, fearing lest it was after their bacon, love it, retired Retired for safety to the shelter of the barn. <laughs> Gotta save the bacon. I love some of those old-timey phrases. Gotta save yeah. my bacon. I just prefer to think of it as that they actually had an unrealistic amount of bacon uh, with them and they just thought, that thing's after my bacon. Not today, jelly monster. <laughs> 
The apparition finally flew off towards the east, but when it reached the city limits, it returned and began to hover over Mr. Martin's house. Mr. McIntyre was in favour of arousing the family, but his companion interposed his objection, so the men watched it alone until after three o'clock when they drove off to the ice house, leaving the spook or whatever it was still hovering high in the air. The ice ain't gonna shift itself, I guess. It remained there as long as they could see its position, but was gone when they returned at daylight. Both of them are very much worked up over the affair and very naturally associated with the supernatural. They will carry a Springfield rifle to the barn the next time they go. If the apparition again comes flapping around, they will drill a hole in him with an ounce of cold lead. <laughs> and in the following days, it would come out that McIntyre and Gray were not the only witnesses to this phenomenon. Are these guys prohibition gangsters because they talk <laughs> like them? Reverend G.W. Switzer immediately came forward to corroborate the sighting. This is recounted in the same newspaper two days later, and chronologically it took place a couple of hours before the sighting by the ice salesman. So this is the reverend. Shortly after midnight, he stepped into his back door yard to get a drink at the well. As he stood there, a strange, weird sensation crept over him, and although he is unable to say whether he was attracted by any sound or not, he suddenly felt his attention drawn upward, and raising his eyes with a full expectation of beholding something, he saw what both puzzled and astonished him. The night was very dark and very still, no breath of air stirring, but propelled by some unseen force he saw sweeping toward him from the southwest, the apparition. It was 16 feet long and 8 feet wide, resembling a mass of floating drapery. In the Reverend's own poetic words, Michael, shaped like a fleecy milk-white cloud or like a demon in a shroud. Oh yeah, demon in a shroud. We've already had The Lavender Sun as a 1950s science fiction novel. Demon in a shroud is definitely Wheatley or someone like that. Any novelist from, really from the 50s to the early 90s. Actually, the more I think about it, Demon in a Shroud is more a science fiction title because it's like... Yeah, yeah. The demon, everyone, is actually a computer. Case closed. <laughs> it was much too low to be a cloud and moved far too swiftly. Besides, there was no wind at all. It seemed to work about as it swam through the air in a writhing, twisting manner, similar to the glide of some serpents. Mr. Switzer called his wife out and they watched it until it got to just east of the church. When it began to descend as though about to land in the yard of Mrs. J. M. Lane. They then lost sight of it for the moment, but Mr. Switzer, proceeding into the street, saw it arise again, and he and his wife then watched it circle about town for some time, finally tiring and going into the house with the strange phenomenon still visible. Mr. Switzer is wholly unable to account for it, but is satisfied that it was not the Shawnee Mound Ghost, which I can only assume was some other local legend. I couldn't find much on that. Put more on that, yeah, please. Yeah, no, I tried. I couldn't find anything. The Shawnee Mound Ghost? Yeah. Oh. The Shawnee is a, a Native American tribe. Yeah. They built mounds, so I'm guessing there was one nearby that had a ghost. I don't know. Lots of publications, and especially websites, have put this sighting firmly into the category of atmospheric monsters, or living UFOs as they're sometimes called. On the surface, it's a very, very compelling account. It's rare that a sighting like this would not only be corroborated by multiple witnesses around town, not only that the witnesses would independently describe the object in such similar fashion, but that they would observe the object for so long, hours, that both of the main groups of witnesses actually had to leave while the phenomenon was still ongoing. These are usually fleeting encounters. When was the last time you heard of a UFO or a monster sighting where the thing was visible for so long, the witnesses had an appointment to go to and had to leave? You know, it's not, <laughs> it happens twice in this case. So clearly this was something that was there in the sky for quite a long time. This predates science fiction ideas about aliens and UFOs. For the most part, the witnesses are forced to reach for like an imperfect supernatural touchstone. It's talked about in the language of ghosts, even though that's not quite a, a perfect analogy. They still also talk about it as like a tangible living thing. So to me, that strengthens the idea that these people really did see something that they couldn't identify. They, they probably weren't just making something up from the pop culture of the day because what they describe doesn't properly jive with the pop culture of the time. It sounds almost like it's something from later, you know? Yeah. As it happens, there is a conclusion to the series of news reports 
surrounding the Crawfordsville monster. And unfortunately, it's a conclusion that's all too often and all too conveniently left out of later coverage. In the September 8th edition of the Crawfordsville Journal, it transpired that yet another two witnesses had seen this oddity in the skies over the town on the same night. John Hornbeck was in his yard at midnight when he spotted it and called up his neighbour, Abe Hernley, who also observed the thing. However, this brave pair decided to investigate and actually chase the phantom through the nighttime streets. Eventually, they caught up to it and were able to get right up close to the thing and identify it as an abnormally huge flock of killdeer. Now, I didn't know what killdeer were either, Mike, but I found out... Flock? Are they birds? Yeah, they're a member of the plover family. This is a bird with a pale white underside with brown or reddish upper parts and is found migrating in huge numbers in August and September in exactly this part of the world. Now, if you've ever seen a murmuration of starlings, yeah. you'll know that some species of bird can fly in astonishingly dense flock sweeping back and forth like a living cloud in the sky undulating changing shape twisting and turning like one huge living organism in the largest examples they look almost like a huge thrashing amoeba sometimes these flocks are so dense you can hardly see through them it's an amazing sight if you, if you see the vast murmurations that take place over rome for example even over southern england members of the plover family also murmurate usually in smaller numbers than starlings, but not always. I found one video on YouTube of a golden plover murmuration, a very close relative of killdeer, at RSPB Snetisham in Norfolk, or Snetisham, not, not sure whether it's Snetisham That's easy or for you Snetisham. To say. I'm, I'm sure someone will write in and, uh, and tell me I'm, both is Wasn't wrong. Wasn't that one of the words they used to describe those star jelly things? This is definitely a Snetisham. <laughs> <laughs> so this thing is, is immense in the video. Altogether, they look like a I mean, they do. They look like a cloud serpent sweeping over the mud flats. It's quite amazing, really. If you want to see this video for yourself, it's a pig of a title, unfortunately. If you search for Upload Stunning Golden Plover Murmuration RSPB Snetisham Norfolk 23 Oct 18428P, it should come up. So if you imagine that flying at night with their pale bellies lit from below, flying so close you can't see any sky between them, it would be quite the sight, yeah. I think. And they also have this pining and yet yeah, mournful call. The question then is, why were these birds flocking in such huge numbers at night? Well, the news article has something to say on that point too. It seems that Crawfordsville had recently installed those newfangled electric streetlights, Michael. Oh yeah, they're everywhere now. And the birds may have confused the illumination for dawn. The lights may also have contributed to the unusual appearance of the flock. The eyewitnesses might well have been used to seeing flocks of birds. They probably wouldn't be used to seeing them in the dark, lit up from below. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, the Crawfordsville monster, it's a fantastic piece of modern mythology. I'm sure there are some who will still defend it as a, as a real atmospheric beast encounter. I won't fight to the death to debunk it. I think it's a, a beautiful piece of strangeness. I, I kind of almost don't want to trample all over it. From a folkloric perspective, it's fine to just enjoy it, but from a hard, factual point of view, yeah, I, I think it's been quite well explained, to be honest. Also well explained, and not something I want to spend too much time on, but I'd be amiss if I didn't at least bring it up, because people are going to be asking about it. Are the supposed entities often referred to as rods, or sometimes skyfish? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when those videos first came out and people were losing their minds before it was debunked. Yeah, man. Early days of YouTube, about 2005, 2006. Yeah, but I'm talking like, I remember documentary programs on rods and I'm sure it was like the late 90s. Really? Well, that's when I became aware of them, like 2005, 2006. But what you're saying does jive with the kind of timeline here. So rods are elongated linear anomalies usually with the appearance of having sort of undulating membranes along the sides, seen in photographs and very frequently seen zipping around in video recordings. In almost every case, they're observed in footage where the people filming claim they didn't notice the rods at the time of shooting, but only later saw them when reviewing the footage. The first person to really draw attention to this phenomenon 
was a chap by the name of Jose Escamilla. Quite aptly, Escamilla was out trying to film UFOs at Roswell in 1994 when he noticed these strange shapes moving around on his footage. He then went on to have a career making documentaries on this and other paranormal topics. Believers in rods as an anomalous phenomenon often speculate that these are alien life forms, interdimensional entities, or perhaps most commonly, and most relevant to this episode, that they are flying organisms that natively inhabit the skies of Earth, that they're somehow invisible to the human eye but can be picked up on video equipment. Well, it's bullshit. Yeah. I, I won't sit on the fence with this one. Not that they're all hoaxes necessarily. I'm sure lots of people film these and are genuinely puzzled as to what they've captured, although I strongly suspect that most of the people making money off the idea know exactly what they're doing. Rods are long exposure image trails. It's as simple as that. In most cases, they're just fast flying insects. In rarer cases, birds or leaves or inanimate flying debris. When it's a flying winged animal, the wing beats merge together into like an undulating shape producing the supposed membrane along the side. It's the same effect you get if you've ever seen a long exposure photo of a road at night. You know, you get yeah. the long trails of the car headlights all sweeping together. And there's a transparency to it as well. So yeah. they, they, they look like a, like almost like a deep sea animal that doesn't yes. have any yeah, pigmentation yeah. or anything like that. There can be a transparency in some cases and they can look strikingly solid in others. And that, that also sort of muddies the waters a little bit as well. But you're absolutely right. If you take a photo with an exposure of, let's say, a quarter of a second or a tenth of a second of someone waving or throwing a ball, the moving parts of the image, the hand or the ball, will be blurred into a trail at a 50th or a 60th of a second and thereabouts around the exposure time of each individual frame of a consumer camera shooting video. Even up to a hundredth of a second and beyond, fast flying insects catching the light will produce elongated rods in the final footage if they're moving quickly enough. And you don't need a special camera. You don't need to have selected... People be like, yeah, but I just took this. I wasn't doing anything funny. You don't need to have selected a special setting. The automatic mode on anyone's camera can change itself to a slower than ideal exposure time if it thinks the light level demands it, potentially producing this effect. You know, you've just declared war on the rods community, Martin. I know. I, know. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they'll come up with but this, but that. And, and okay, you know, the thing is there may be other causes and other weird things hiding in there but but the vast majority we're talking about you know really you can almost write off the like 99.99% of of it and I know that sounds like I'm declaring war I don't mean to piss anyone off but we try to leave the door open with certain things it's like when we did the black eyed kids episode and that was a really fun episode and obviously I'd had a personal experience as well to throw into the mix and mm. it was great doing that episode but you know, on that topic, we were able to kind of look at the genesis of the idea, and then that yeah. that makes you more skeptical of it. We're not debunkers. I think being a debunker is actually a. I think that's a a poor way to approach information. But we're critical, and so if yeah. something. So you often find things that well, you know, they just don't hold up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I want them to hold up. A lot of the time, we try to present information that shows both yeah. sides. But anyway, sorry, we're getting away from from. Uh, big, big bastard point, beast. But, but <laughs> so, so what I'm talking about with exposure time and trails, and it's not some far out scientific mumbo jumbo that's beyond the wit of ordinary folk. Someone who's not that familiar with photography, not everyone can be into everything. They might not be particularly familiar with this effect, but the, the effects of exposure time on objects in motion are something anyone with more than a passing familiarity with photography knows about and has experience of and has to deal with when taking different types of pictures under different conditions. So it's especially disheartening to me when I see people who I'm sure know this stuff, who definitely know better, trying to pitch this as something it isn't. Escamilla was a documentary filmmaker, Mike. He knew cameras. He knew exactly what these were, yeah. I, I believe, anyway. You know, I, I would like to believe in them too. I love mysterious things. I'm on this podcast talking about mysteries and the macabre, it would be the easiest thing in the world for me to throw critical thinking to the wind and just feed our listeners a diet of unadulterated sensationalism. Leave out all the ifs and buts, just poo-poo all the all the kind of the rational explanations. Treat absolutely everything in the paranormal-related episodes as unquestionably 
a real paranormal phenomenon. People like that. I mean, I'd probably enjoy listening to that. Yeah, I listen to some podcasts that throw critical approaches out the window. That can be okay if that's clearly what you're setting out to do. You know, and, and everything's more exciting and straightforward and satisfying that way. We'd probably get more listeners if we did that, but it just wouldn't sit right with me to put that out because I feel like if you're doing a even a kind of half serious, half sincere show, like I think we, we try to be, we don't always manage, but we try to be sincere. You've got to be intellectually honest, you know, like check yourself, follow up the alternative explanations, understand and learn from them, even if they're not always as satisfying. Honestly and level-headedly consider like what's the greatest likelihood here. I mean, it's fine if you're like, yeah, obviously we're doing just a show about trying to creep people out, like you're doing a creepy, not creepy pasta, but you know, like the kind of narration channel or whatever, where they might just be like telling the stories. And the point of it is yeah. just to have the folklore and that's fine. Just tell the stories and not pick them apart but we are doing something a little bit a little bit different here because if we didn't if we didn't debunk when it had to be done when it was clear bullshit then it's fake news you know it, that's yeah. that's the thing when it's indefensible then it's just fake news while we're on the subject of fake news though are you ready for this mike i am ready atmospheric jellyfish yes you know when i was researching this and i found talk of atmospheric jellyfish on a website called cryptids.fandom.com cryptid spelt with a z naturally i was buzzing i was like yes here we go (laughs) this is the sort of shit i imagine looking into when i picked this topic and then i looked through the photos and i dug a bit deeper and a bit deeper it's another bummer mike the photos are mostly lens flares there's one or two that are clearly not there's a famous one that looks like a sort of uh, a sort of cloud trailing tentacles. It's quite cool. It looks quite impressive, but it's hard to be sure you're not looking at like a puff of smoke from an explosion or something. And there are one or two interesting associated events that have been lumped into the atmospheric jellyfish category that don't appear to be lens flare related. And I'll cover one of those in a little bit. But the bread and butter of this phenomenon appears to be people misidentifying lens flares on photos of the sky. What are lens flares? Well, I'm sure everyone knows what the words mean, but what are they? They're internal reflections, light reflecting or scattering inside the glass, inside the barrel of the lens. This happens as a result of a bright light source, most commonly the sun, but you can get moon flares under longer exposures or artificial lights or really any light source that's strong enough. When we think of lens flares, we often think of them as like a halo around the sun or in immediate proximity to the light source. But there are a lot of different types. The shape and the location of the flares are influenced by the design of the lens, by how many glass elements there are in the lens and what position, any filters in front of the lens, the shape of the aperture inside the camera, any coatings on the lens, the position of the light source. Lenses with a convex front element, one that bulges outwards, can be especially prone to picking up secondary flares from light sources that are off to the side. You can get lens flares from light sources that aren't even in your photo. If you think of the flares that J.J. Abrams is famous for using in a lot of his films... He, like, deliberately shines torches into the lens. Exactly. One of our favourite filmmakers, John Carpenter, is very famous for it because of the type of lens that that he uses. Yeah, so like J.J. Abrams, I believe John Carpenter uses anamorphic lenses as well. Well, that's that's why a lot of people, a lot of the filmmakers that come through now who idolise John Carpenter's movies, they they want that, want that sort of look. yeah. When the light source is off to the side of an anamorphic lens, it produces a very characteristic horizontal streak-shaped lens flare, and it's very different to the lens flare you might get if you point your camera at the sun and you get the circles. So that's a good indication of how they can be all kinds of different shapes, but there's so many factors involved in what shape they can be, but the huge variety of lenses and cameras out there. In the real world, these secondary flares can appear in the shape of ovals, hexagons, hourglass shapes, fan shapes, semicircles, disc shapes, manta shapes, even jellyfish shapes. And they can appear anywhere in the shot. They can appear, they commonly appear on the opposite side of the frame from the light source. Looking at some of these, I can pretty much draw a line from the flare to where the light source is just out of shot that's producing the jellyfish. In one, it's probably a bright section of an aurora borealis. Another, it could be the moon or sun. But like what we talked about with rods and exposure time, this is not some rare fluky phenomenon. These are commonplace. I looked at some of the supposed photographs of sky jellyfish, 
a look at the, the so-called NASA jellyfish anomaly, which was identified by the Alien Disclosure Group going through old images of night, the night sky in, in NASA archives. I looked at the Dutch flying jellyfish. I looked at the Norwegian atmospheric jellyfish. I'm looking at the Dutch flying jellyfish right now. And, and I think when I look at these, I have taken photos with flares like this mm-hmm. and not looked twice at it. Actually, maybe if the sun puts in another appearance, I'll go out and try and recreate it. But yeah, completely underwhelmed by the sky jellyfish photos, I'm sorry to say. I'm just looking at some of them, and I think uh, I totally see what you're saying. There are a couple that I've seen where it's like, well, you know, they (laughs) they could just be your bog standard UFO. Well, yes, that's the other thing. Some of them could just be anything. Yeah, and there's one there that's quite compelling when you first look at it but it really what it looks like to me is it looks like someone genuinely saw a cloud formation that really looked like a jellyfish. I mean that one could be uh that could be like a chimney's put out a puff of smoke or, or like yeah, it looks like it looks like a cloud to me, yeah. Without the whole story and without more to back it up, it's a little bit there's not much there. There was an incident involving an object resembling a jellyfish that was observed by at least eighty five reported witnesses and probably thousands of actual witnesses across two continents, from Copenhagen in the west to Vladivostok on the Russian Pacific coast. Are you ready to go behind the Iron Curtain, Mike? Always. That's a pretty big jellyfish. (laughs) This event is sometimes referred to as the Petrozavodsk phenomenon. Nice. The Petrozavodsk miracle. Some websites refer to it explicitly as the Petrozavodsk jellyfish. Petrozavodsk being the city at the centre of the observations, the Soviet authorities of the time designated it simply the phenomenon of 20 September 1977. In the early hours of the morning, luminous objects were reported in the sky across the Soviet Union and neighbouring countries, particularly but not exclusively centred on the northwest of the vast country. It seems that most, if not all, observations were made between 1am and 1.30am UTC. It was seen by air traffic controllers at Helsinki Airport. It was seen by the crews of fishing boats leaving harbour at Primorsk. Nighttime staff at the Leningrad Maritime Trade Port reported a huge glowing object in the sky. Just as with the lilac sun event on the other side of the Iron Curtain, many of the witnesses feared they were seeing the start of a thermonuclear war. The incidents stretched way out into the Russian Far East. It was even seen by aircraft flying the route between Singapore and Moscow. But they clustered most intensively on the city of Petrozavodsk, capital city of the Karelian Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic. It appeared beneath the constellation of Ursa Major at 4am, 1am UTC. As bright as Venus and glowing in intensity as it ascended and moved slowly across the sky. As Russian news agency correspondent Nikolai Milov reported, the object first appeared in the form of a huge star that flared up in the dark sky, impulsively sending shafts of light to the earth. He described it spreading out above the city in the shape of a jellyfish, quote, showering the city with a multitude of very fine rays which created an image of pouring rain. At some point, quote, the luminescent rays ceased and the jellyfish turned into a bright semicircle. For this next bit, I'm going to be a cheat and just read from the Wikipedia article because it's quite a complex series of observations. We'll forgive you, man. We'll forgive you. The object, surrounded by a translucent coat, was initially spotted at about 4am in the northeastern part of the sky below Ursa Major at an azimuth of about 40 degrees. The initial brightness of the object was apparently comparable to that of Venus. The object moved ascendantly towards Ursa Major. The course angle as determined by former pilot and eyewitness V. Barkatov was 240 degrees. As the object ascended, it was expanding and pulsating, but a decrease in brightness was not noted. The object moved slowly for about three minutes. Shortly before the object stopped, it dispersed a bright cloud. The cloud was round or oval in shape. Its maximum angular size was larger than that of Ursa Major, about 30 degrees in diameter. The altitude of the object during the formation of the cloud was estimated at 7.5 kilometers plus or minus 4 based on eyewitnesses' observations, or at least 6 kilometers plus or minus 5 based on parallax. 
The linear diameter of the object's core was estimated at either 119 or at about 60 metres. The diameter of the object's jellyfish-like cupola was estimated by Felix Ziegel at about 105 metres, based on the drawing of eyewitness Andre Akimov. The object itself was red in colour and emitted a bluish-white glow. The lighting of the area was compared to that from a full moon. According to eyewitness V. Trubashev, the ground was lightened like in the white night, which I think it must be a Russian phrase for either the full moon or the midsummer. The glowing cloud then developed a dark spot about the central core. The spot was quickly expanding while the glow was fading away. The object hovered over Petrozovudsk for five minutes, then moved away. Before hovering, the object moved slowly with the angular velocity of a passenger aircraft. After the hovering, its speed had increased. The entire phenomenon lasted 10 to 15 minutes. According to a 1995 report by the Research Institute of Anomalous Phenomena, which I think is like a Ukrainian MUFON, essentially, I think, at night, early on the 20th of September 1977, over a vast area in the northwest of the European part of the USSR, unusual light phenomena in the atmosphere were observed, namely the formation and motion of bright luminous bodies surrounded by external shells and emitting light rays or jets of quaint shapes. The shells transformed and diffused within 10 to 15 minutes. Besides, a more long-lived stable glow was observed, mostly in the northeastern part of the sky. Possibly due to the light levels, which were again, described as brighter than those of the full moon, it appears there was an effect on vegetation in the Petrozovsk area. Scientist and mathematician Yuri Linick described the unseasonable blooming of a rose garden and several other species of plants. Curiously, there also appears to have been an impact on technology. Computer operators and engineers in and around Petrozovsk experienced huge equipment failures coinciding with the appearance of the jellyfish. The countries bordering Russia, especially those where the phenomenon was directly seen, were concerned. There was a real fear that the Soviet Union was fuel testing some kind of new super weapon, Mike. But it seems Russian officials were just as in the dark, that just as spooked by the potential ramifications of the object. The Soviet leaders internally ordered the Academy of Sciences of the USSR to undertake an analysis of the phenomenon to determine if the apparition was cause for concern and whether further study was needed. They reported in 1977 that eyewitness accounts from across Russia were mutually consistent with one another and were complementary rather than contradictory. They concluded that the phenomenon was real, it was no mass hallucination or hoax, that the cause was genuinely unexplained, it wasn't clear whether it was biological in nature, whether it was astronomical, man-made, extraterrestrial, and if it posed any threat, they didn't know. But the report concluded that the implications were far-reaching and demanded further study. With that, according to a very interesting Moscow Times article from 2016, another secretive investigation was launched by a group specially formed under the control of the Academy of Sciences, a group sometimes spoken of in later Western literature as the Russian X-Files but referred to within the Soviet government simply as the network. Oh, nice. This network was headed by a chap called Yuli Platov, an astrophysicist. Speaking to the Moscow Times in 2016, then in his 80s, he said, maybe we would really find aliens or maybe our findings would have military applications. It wasn't clear at the start what we might find. Now, the network weren't just set up solely to investigate this, it was the genesis of the group, but their purpose was to scientifically investigate a whole range of unidentified aerial phenomena. We don't have time to get into all that right now, but ultimately out of the 3,000 UFO reports they would investigate between 78 and 90, they would identify 300 as anomalous. However, the Petrozovudsk jellyfish would not be one of those the jellyfish incident, at least as far as the network was concerned, would eventually be explained. There are those who d dissent from that view. There are those who think this in itself is a cover-up. I'll talk about that briefly in a minute. But the great irony here is that this most Russian of airborne mysteries might have been first solved independently 
by an American within days of the incident before the Academy of Sciences completed their investigation long before the network was even formed. Like the great space race, the great debunk race. Uh, <laughs> everyone knows about that. They talk about it. We put our mysteries on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. James Oberg worked in mission control at Houston. He happened upon a report of the Petrozovudsk jellyfish incident in an American newspaper. As a NASA employee with an avid interest in Russian space flight, he knew that not far from Petrozovudsk at Plesetsk, the space program of the USSR had a top secret launch facility. In the slightly more open climate of the US agencies, Oberg was able to pick up a phone and ring his colleagues over at the NASA Satellite Tracking Center to ask, hey, do you know if anything was launched from Plesetsk recently? And sure enough, at 4.01 a.m. that morning, Petrozovutsk time, within a few hundred miles, coinciding precisely with the first observations of lights in the sky and just minutes before the jellyfish began to appear, there had been a satellite launched from Plesetsk. Specifically, the satellite was one designated Cosmos 955. In fact, it did get a very brief mention in the Russian state press. I have seen a clipping of it, but translated, it just gives fairly dry information about its orbit duration and whatnot. It doesn't mention the location. It doesn't mention the time of the launch, so where it was launched from or when. But as far as I can tell, the Academy of Sciences and the network don't seem to have made this connection for quite some years. According to Yuli Platov, this was a result of the rigid compartmentalization of information in the Soviet Union at the time. Scientists working for the space program in Russia, who, who likely would have been able to join the dots, weren't permitted to speak about it simply because the Soviet space program was so secretive. It bears mentioning that what little was put in the public domain about Cosmos 955 presented it as being purely a science mission. In actual fact, we now know that was a cover. Cosmos 955 was an electronic signals intelligence gathering satellite beyond top secret in 1977. Those in the know about the real purpose of Cosmos 955 were probably more willing to let other arms of the Soviet government waste their money on investigating the phenomenon than to share their information and potentially invite unwanted attention to their secret spy satellite program. In any case, this was the eventual conclusion of the network that the Petrozovudsk phenomenon was the result of the launch of Cosmos 955. But, but wait a minute, okay. How does a rocket launch cause a jellyfish to appear in the sky? How could you possibly mistake a rocket for a giant glowing jellyfish? Well, Cosmos 955 was launched aboard a Vostok 2M, a two-stage expendable carrier rocket. With these rockets, they're blasting out burning gases as they ascend, much like myself, <laughs> with the exhaust gathering behind it in a trail called the rocket plume. Different levels of thrust passing through different layers, different thicknesses of atmosphere can have different effects on this plume, spreading it out or what have you, making it seem denser or thinner depending on the design of the rocket, these, these exhaust gases can appear not streaking out behind the rockets in a straight line as we might picture it, but blooming out in a big arc behind the vehicle. If the fuel from, from each of the different thrusters is even minutely uneven in how it burns, the rocket spins as it climbs, creating like a spiral or vortex, like a Catherine wheel type effect in the plume. You might have seen that in, in other recent photos from Norway where the, the rocket launch caused this weird uh, effect in the sky. Most spectacularly though, the separation. The jettisoning of the first stage involves detonating a ring of explosive bolts to blast it free of the upper stage, followed by the firing of the upper rocket pushing it away. So that can create like a smoke ring that spreads readily in the high thin atmosphere. It can create cone-like effects from the upper stage thrust. And the jettison section of the rocket as it falls can still be burning excess fuel it can have its own plume, its own shockwaves, there can be pieces of red hot debris falling. Now, in the daytime, the bright daytime sky, this is not particularly striking from a distance. In the middle of the night, there's very little natural light to, to catch the various exhausts and ephemeral, gaseous forms left in the sky by a multi-stage rocket launch. 
But in the two or three hours immediately after sunset and immediately before sunrise, roughly within the period known as astronomical twilight, which began about 20 minutes before launch that morning in Petrozovodsk, then these plumes and clouds, which can look close by but are actually tens or hundreds of kilometres up, which is exactly where they would have to be to be seen over a wide area simultaneously, these gases will be illuminated by the sun from over the horizon. And this can cause them to glow and shimmer spectacularly in the night sky. In the years since Cosmos 955, similar events have occurred with such regularity and usually without quite so much secrecy that the phenomenon is now commonly termed in the space industry rocket jellyfish or space jellyfish. If you look up space jellyfish online, there's a Wikipedia page for them and you'll see lots of spectacular photographs of these intricate and quite quite beautiful structures in some cases. I just want there to be giant jellyfish in space, man. Me too, Michael. I'm sure somewhere there are, somewhere out there in the <laughs> infinity of space. Like I say, there are some who hold to the idea that there's something paranormal or anomalous about the Petrozovudsk phenomenon, be it an alien spacecraft or a giant living organism that manifested over Russia. They point to the electronic effects on computer hardware, the fact that some objects involved in the phenomenon seem to move in the wrong direction for an orbital rocket, which would normally be launched west to east in order to benefit from the the Earth's rotation. Well, Yuli Platov, head of the network, made a further discovery in the 1980s, yet another juicy revelation. He believes that a failed ballistic missile test was made from the same location at precisely the same time as the Cosmos launch to benefit from the cover of the satellite launch, presumably because it was hard for foreign nations to separate two simultaneous launches. And this may have muddied the waters or muddied the skies, I suppose, even more. Even now, there's obviously some sleight of hand, some degree of misinformation around this. There are certainly some mysterious elements here still. But I think, on balance with all I've seen on this, it's safe to assume that this was indeed more likely a non-literal space jellyfish as opposed to a literal atmospheric jellyfish. Shame. It is a shame. It is a shame, Michael. But pursuit of the truth, if we found something that was real, we'd, we'd have our socks blown Absolutely. off. Absolutely. Absolutely. The person often credited with sparking interest in the idea of atmospheric jellyfish or generally in atmospheric sky monsters was a Kiwi-born US merchant sailor turned author by the name of Trevor James Constable. Constable wrote several books on the subject, They Live in the Sky, 1958, The Cosmic Pulse of Light, 1976, and he believed most UFOs were life forms, critters as he called them. I think I've heard that used before in ufology. Do you remember the supposed intercepted NASA transmissions? There were a number of these transmissions that were supposedly intercepted, and uh, it shows you footage from the space shuttle and from the the international space station and you see all these things floating around oh yeah yeah they look kind of like spaceships yeah i think i mentioned that earlier it's the sts uh that's right so i think the term critters was used to describe some of those things yeah so i think this probably originates with constable some of his critters were like big unicellular globs similar to the the philadelphia glob some had metallic or crystalline outer cases giving them the appearance of being a more solid vehicle-like object. That was how he explained why some UFOs look like vehicles and some don't. Some, he thought, were, were partly composed of ionised gas, like plasma, essentially. And Constable suggested these creatures would be mostly invisible to human beings, but reflected light in the infrared and could be visible under certain circumstances or show up on certain types of photographic film. To prove this, he went out into the Mojave Desert with cameras and infrared film and claimed to have captured images of these critters. He produced quite a mesmerising body of work featuring huge discs and blobs high in the sky or hovering over the land, changing shape, seemingly bioluminescing in the sky. A lot of these photos are quite impressive, certainly at first glance, and really do seem to depict some genuinely weird shapes. If nothing else, a lot of them are almost worthy pieces of abstract art. However, vague objects and formless disks, again, 
fall very much into the visual realm of various photographic artifacts such as lens flares, bokeballs, lens scratches and smudges, film damage, film drying spots, actually a lot of these incorrectly agitated film where if you don't agitate it bubbles can form on the surface of the film which means that the developer doesn't get at those bits Mm. etc etc and and in fact several of his findings are quite recognisable to me as some of these artefacts. I don't claim to be like a photo analysis expert but I do work with both digital and film photography as part of my day job and I can say with some certainty that most of his critters in the photos could be or outright are caused by one or another of these common artifacts which for me that does cast some doubt on his judgment maybe not entirely but it just makes me a little bit suspicious what's more is there are thousands of people out there nowadays with infrared adapted digital cameras it's a popular kind of alternative process with hobbyists and photographers most digital cameras have an IR cut filter over the sensor and that, like it's what it says, it cuts down on the IR light that comes through it. But if you remove the IR cut filter, so the sensor accepts near infrared light in addition to visible light, and then you put an IR pass filter on the front of the lens, so that cuts out everything but IR light, you can take photos in infrared and then convert them to black and white or colour shift them down to visible colours in Photoshop. It's even easier in film photography because you can actually buy, I think now you can only get the black and white stuff, but you can buy black and white infrared film. You used to be able to get colour as well, but you can just pop that in any film camera with any lens. Pop a filter in the front, you're taking photos in infrared. And all these people taking infrared photos on a regular basis in various parts of the infrared spectrum, depending on the setup, are not all coming back with photos of sky beasts. In fact, Mike, I've got an old rule of, I think it's, uh, is it here somewhere? I've got an old rule of a uh, rolly infrared film. Maybe we could go out and try and catch some of these ourselves at some point. How about that? That would be amazing. Put it up on the Facebook page. to check page. up on Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. I do want to give them the benefit of the doubt because, full disclosure, I couldn't actually get hold of the books themselves in time for this podcast. Some of them go for nearly £100 second hand. But yeah, I've seen most of the photos online, but I'm really only familiar with his work through the lens of other writers and other articles. Carl Schuker's blog has an interesting extended discussion on it, for example. It's possible that Constable dealt with my concerns in the books. Because I haven't read them, I can't say for sure, so I don't want to write him off completely. But I do have my doubts. But one interesting detail of his theory was that while these creatures were not usually visible to human eyes, they did show up on radar that this explained radar ghosts or radar angels, which are mysterious contacts that sometimes show up on radar. Constable believed that radar irritated their tender biology and would provoke them to predatory behaviour, the source of unexplained cattle mutilations usually attributed to aliens and also some human wow. disappearances. Cattle mutilation research is really interesting, but the fact that I've, n- I've never heard that as a as an explanation. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's pretty fascinating, but atmospheric beasts, man, I don't know. It's a tough one. I love the idea of this so much. I came at the topic fully prepared to find stuff and be able to say, if not, there's definitely something to this, at least to be able to say there's a few real meaty mysteries here without glaringly obvious natural explanations but ultimately from what I've seen so far although there are a few interesting phenomena and events some cool theories real evidence linking them to actual atmospheric creatures is pretty thin on the ground it's all a wee bit tenuous if you pardon the pun but I do love the folklore about it as I said before it's sometimes fun to just explore the stories for what they are without actually claiming they're necessarily true or trying to pick them apart So with that in mind, there are a couple of further stories, just quick ones. Encounters really, legends of encounters with atmospheric beings that I came across while researching this episode that I just wanted to share just for their weirdness, just for their sheer uncategorizable bizarreness. The first is an encounter with a creature, or rather an entity maybe, that earned itself the name The Sky Spitter. This is a pretty obscure story, Mike, and something I heard about first over on the Whatcast 
It was first reported, as far as I can tell, in a book by Jerome Clark called Unexplained. This story concerns a chap by the name of Tom Dercole. That is Italian for Tom of Hercules, Michael. I know that's not relevant to the story. I just know you love to hear all about the unusual names. Another name for the Talking Till Dawn board of names. Just a wee treat for you there, Mike. Names of champions. (laughs) Now, this wasn't a Roman hero and god, as far as we know. He was Mr. Dercola, science teacher at Garden City Junior High in Garden City, Long Island. A hero of a kind. Hero of a different kind, yes. In 1974, on a clear summer morning, the sun is shining down on the hamlet of Oyster Bay, and Tom Dercola steps out of his house and walks over to his car. As he does so, who knows why, maybe just because he's a man without a care in the world, with no inkling of the strangeness that's about to quite literally descend upon him. He glances back a moment to gander at a cute wee cloud he can see over the roof of his house. But then he notices there's something funny about this cloud. The only other clouds in the sky that day were a light dusting of high cumulocirrus. These are clouds sometimes called autocumulus that you'd probably know as the sort of bitty, woolly, sheepskin looking clouds that you sometimes see high up when the sky is otherwise clear. The one that caught Tom Dirkla's eye was nothing like the other clouds in the sky. It was a small, spherical, dark cloud. A very low cloud. So low, he realised, it seemed to be hovering just a few feet above his house. As a man of science, and presumably therefore a man with a keen interest in the natural world, Derkula was intrigued and continued to observe this object as it moved through the air, taking mental notes of what he saw. These are his words. The cloud seemed to move and slightly enlarge as I watched it. This basketball-sized cloud floated back and forth across the peak of the roof, changing in shape from a small globular mass to a larger ovoid and finally becoming an abstract, multi-curved, dark, vaporous something. It finally measured about 6 feet in height and 1.5 feet in width. Tom doesn't himself say this, but it strikes me that that's pretty much the dimensions of a slender, adult, male human being. If I wanted to sensationalise the story, I might suggest it's almost as though the so-called cloud was trying to mimic the creature it was examining. Oh, nice. The story then goes somewhere even stranger than that. Tom Dercola kept watching the thing, just stunned and confused when he observed the cloud grow a mouth. It then seemed to inhale Michael, purse its lips, and proceeded to spit a jet of water all over Tom and his car. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, what a world what a world (laughs) I'm having a really bad day (laughs) and all of a sudden this mouth comes out and it's getting spits on my car (laughs) the Jerome Clark book says after a minute the spray stopped I'm like a minute? that's not a spit (laughs) maybe he's using minute figuratively or maybe it just did fully soak the guy for a full 60 seconds I don't know but it's like that's spewing it was sick on him (laughs) yeah sky puker when the spray stopped the cloud had vanished weird very strange like i say it's a one-off event that happened it doesn't seem to have been a repeating phenomenon there are no photographs although i can prove that tom derkla was a real science teacher at that school you can find his obituary online He, he passed away in 2008 sadly probably nothing to do with this he was 82 when he died, but you never Sniffing know. Sniffing methane. Aye. Tasting uh, sky monsters. I'm a man of science. Put it in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Although he was definitely a real guy, there were no other witnesses, no other evidence, no other documentation, no recurrences. So for me, it goes in the cool story box because it's hard to delve any deeper into the phenomenon, short of maybe find his surviving kids and get their recollections or something. Listening to that, and some of the other descriptions that you've given tonight. I have at some point toyed with the idea of doing a trickster episode. Mm. Because the trickster is either the personification of a mechanism within reality that just Mm. messes with people, or is this 
mythological creature that you see in many, many places around the world. Some people think it's a total cop-out, but if you look at like Skinwalker Ranch, for example, yeah. when you look at, at that, it involves things in the sky that warp, shift, change shape. The, the trickster element is this idea that these things have an agency to them and they show themselves when you... The goblin universe. Yeah, when you can't take a photo of them or you can't... Reality assume. is just messing with you, yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying that I believe that, but I think that... This is a perfect personification that, of that. Yeah, 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 it becomes a mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and then just spits on you for six yeah. seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely say that qualifies. Oh, 100%. The worst you ever seen ever. I'd have rather been abducted to get anally probed. <laughs> They'd be vomited on by a sky monster. I got the floating mouth. <laughs> it's so completely bizarre that it defies categorization even among the world of the paranormal. But I suppose at the same time, it doesn't seem beyond the pale as a potential rare meteorological event that maybe just has been a bit over humanized in the retelling like we can all spot faces and stuff in clouds you know mm -hmm. could have been a small lenticular cloud that forming over his rooftop maybe forming over his air con vents or, or something or, or like the sun heating a wet roof like a microclimate kind of thing then it drifts away from there which breaks its equilibrium and it all suddenly recondenses dumping the water on the poor teacher i'm no expert that doesn't seem like an impossibility but then again, a science teacher, yeah, I don't know, whatever Tom Derkla really encountered that day, whether it was an atmospheric being, a sentient cloud, some sort of elemental thing, a rare natural phenomenon, whether it was the cosmic trickster, whether he just fried the wrong mushrooms that morning, the man was a true scientist in his reaction. He went inside, changed, drove to his lab at Garden City Junior High, and there he ran a pH test on his sodden shirt and found that indeed the liquid he had been doused with was none other than dihydrogen monoxide. Deadly dihydrogen water, Mike. Just water. Just water. If it had been some strange extraterrestrial fluid, that might have served as hard evidence that something truly unexplained had happened to him. But if it's just a pH test, though, that's not a rigorous analysis yeah. of what's yeah. actually in the water. That's true. But, you know, no doubt... Tom Derkula was quite relieved not to be dripping with interdimensional rat piss yeah, or something. Yeah, definitely. This massive willy in the sky <laughs> just <laughs> comes <laughs> along. Um, <laughs> but I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's all right. For him, though, confirmation that something physically happened. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I guess he could have had some sort of blackout and then it rained on him or something. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, I mean... <laughs> Right, last story, Michael, okay? Then bed. Beautiful. Then bed. Our next story, our next legend, really, originates in Scotland. Nice. The Northern Isles of Scotland, specifically the Shetland Isles, where you've been, right? I've been there a couple of times, one of my favourite places. So, for those who don't know, the Shetlands are an archipelago a wee bit over 100 miles north of the Scottish mainland. It's way up there in the subarctic latitudes, way up in the North Atlantic. It's almost equidistant between Scotland, the Faroe Islands, and Norway. And in fact, from the 7th to the 15th century, these islands were part of the Kingdom of Norway, not Scotland. This cross-pollination of Norse and Scottish influences, and the sheer isolation of these wind and tide-swept lands, has produced a unique local body of folklore, featuring beings and creatures from both Gaelic and Norse legends, as well as some entirely exclusive to these islands. One of these is a being known only as It. It was recorded in Jesse Saxby's 1932 volume, Shetland Traditional Lore. Saxby, by the way, was quite an interesting figure in her own right. She was a folklorist and suffragette, and she was born and spent a large proportion of her life on Unst, one of the, the Shetland Isles. So, she lived at ground zero of this and was someone intimately familiar with the local rumour and legend. Unfortunately, this particular book of hers, it's long, long out of print. There are no copies for sale online currently. As a result, I'm having to base this on second and third hand discussion on some pretty hokey websites. Some of those websites 
seem to be using other sources as well without actually giving those sources and have not been able to follow them up. It is a really hard term to search for, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Yeah, so, definitely. So that, that's largely why this one goes in the take with a pinch of salt bin. But from what I can gather, it is a truly surreal shape-shifting entity described as a cloud animal, sometimes appearing in a headless humanoid form, sometimes in a, a vaguely quadruped-like form but without legs, just gliding across the landscape like a ghost. Other times, it's seen as a lump of levitating slub, which is an old Shetlandic word for a jellyfish, and sometimes it appears in a form resembling a bag of white wool. It's associated with both the sky, it's described descending from the sky and flying through the sky, and the sea. So there's there's ambiguity about whether this counts as an atmospheric monster or a sea monster or what. One of its hallmarks is a smell of mould, and people who've been attacked by it have supposedly described the sensation as being enclosed or licked by a ginormous soft tongue. If not actually painful, I imagine that feels pretty violating. Was it a mouth by any chance? Uh, this is all very ambiguous, so Mysterious Universe, that rigorous bastion of the, the unvarnished truth, Michael, yeah. recounts an undated, unsourced encounter with an unnamed policeman who was riding a bike. An unknown bike. <laughs> <laughs> when this creature appeared, or at least manifested, and attacked or I don't even know if it is an attack per se, interacted with him, let's say, in a way that seems hard to precisely categorise. He described the sensations of being clad in a soft blanket that smelled of mildew. After it was done doing whatever the hell that was, it seemed to soar away into the sky. What's most interesting about this particular encounter is the version I read, there's no visual description of the thing. Which leaves the door open to the interpretation there was no visual element to this. That it was like an interaction or a communion with something that involved all the senses except sight and sound. Or something almost like an out-of-body experience. In some way that's a lot creepier to me than like some bug-eyed monster jumping out from behind a rock. Oh yeah, it's the reason why although the rare accounts of people being attacked by some incorporeal ghost is, mm. I mean that's more frightening to me than stumbling across Bigfoot yeah you know what do you even you don't even know where you stand you know yeah it leaves it open to interpretation that this is something abstract and not quite not quite part of our reality as we understand it which again in fairness is a question that vaguely overhangs the whole topic of atmospheric monsters or I suppose the police officer could have been experiencing some kind of neurological symptom, if the story's even legit, which is a big if. There is a particular local oral legend about it that I believe does originate, in print form at least, from Saxby's Shetland traditional lore. But the legend goes that there was this remote house on Shetland where each year at Christmas, it would descend to terrorise the inhabitants. Are you sure it's not Santa? <laughs> <laughs> they just wouldn't take the presents. He's coming! He's descending from the skies! <laughs> <laughs> One year, the owner of the house heard the thing arrive outside. He heard it fall to the ground like a mass of dead flesh hitting the floor. Oh, nice. This time, he grabs an axe and a Bible and runs out to meet it. The monstrosity begins to glide away from him. And the man gives chase. It doesn't fly up into the sky. Perhaps it's toying with him. But it seems to be heading for some nearby cliffs. As though it's preparing to escape over them into the sea. The man catches up to it just before the cliff top. And reading from his bible. Buries the axe deep into this weird slab of floating meat. Just before it can slip away. It drops to the ground. Lifeless. The man calls his neighbours to the scene. To show them the creature to see what they make of it, to try and work out if it's even alive or dead. When they each observed the creature, they each described it differently. So standing together with the thing lying on the grass right in front of them, they each saw something different. Terrified, they dragged the body out onto the moor, dug a deep hole in the ground and buried the thing. 
This done, the eyewitnesses were too scared to approach the site, of course not even being sure if it was alive or dead, right? Soon after, they asked a passing stranger if he'd noticed anything unusual as he came by the burial site, and he said, Well, now you mention it, as I passed that section of the moor, a mist rose, and through the fog, I fancied for a minute that I saw something rise from the earth and roll over the land towards the distant sea. Which I think, Mike, is a fantastic specimen of folklore, and actually... It's almost too perfect a story. You know, the way it's buttoned. At the oh, end. of course it is. I mean, it is definitely a story. But as a great example of folklore, I probably, from what I've seen at the moment, I would extend that description to the whole category of atmospheric monsters. I admit that there are still gaps in my reading on this subject just because of the difficulty in getting hold of some of the older works. But from what I've seen, they're great stories. There's some rich literature around this lore, there are some verifiable events, but some of the most famous events that are most commonly wheeled out in support of the idea have in fact been sufficiently explained, and the explanations have been deliberately omitted from a lot of the subsequent writings. There are a few that remain mysterious to some degree, the the Philadelphia Glob for instance, but there's enough good non-anomalous possibilities that it's easy to lean away from atmospheric beasts entirely and you could still have plenty of possibilities to choose from. There's also the issue of aviation. You know, lockdowns aside, there there are an average of almost 10,000 commercial aircraft in the skies of Earth at any one time. Unlike the Conan Doyle story, these aircraft don't encounter any any floating ecosystems or or flying jellyfish, that's that's up to as high as 11 miles when Concorde was still running. There could be stuff higher than that, I guess. I think you'd, you'd still expect to see something from below, especially I think they would quite often show up on close astronomical observations of the sky and not be obvious lens flares. You could argue they're invisible or, or, or nearly invisible, that they're made of some super light material like aerogel type stuff. I mean, it's possible, I think the chances of that being the case just from what I've seen so far, are are fairly low. Or, of course, as you say, that there's the trickster hypothesis. The idea that some of these things really are like a sentient gas or living clouds that can pretty much hide in plain sight, or they're like elemental, sort of, your interdimensional Bigfoot daily. They're something that simply doesn't behave in the way modern science leads us to expect. That would certainly sidestep a lot of those problems. You know, I'm not a particularly huge fan of these ideas when it comes to discussing cryptids, but they're hard to debate against. They're not easy to refute without going down a whole other avenue. But I will say this for the idea. There's part of me that's almost willing to accept that a completely hypothetical encounter with a truly alien intelligence, not extraterrestrial necessarily, doesn't have to be, but alien in the sense of other anomalous, would probably look a lot more like the encounters with the sky spitter, it, the Crawfordsville monster, the Petrozovosk phenomenon, than the stories of like little green or grey men that dominate UFO culture today. Not poo-pooing those ideas here necessarily, but to my mind, a lot of the encounters that we've looked at tonight, if they were real, if they are real, and if they are anomalous, would seem to be a lot less comparable to anything in our everyday human experience. And I think encountering a truly alien intelligence would be incomparable in terms of human experience. So what's your take on atmospheric beasts, Mike? Love the topic, because I think, yeah, there are stories that go back, well, thousands of years of strange things in the sky, and we've touched Mm. upon them before, When we've done at least one UFO episode, I think. We've done a couple of, sort of... Yeah, we did one at Christmas. The, The Warminster thing. It is interesting, I think... Like you say, it is probably just a case of a mixture of folklore, misidentification of things. But I I think it's completely within the realms of possibility that there are spore-like creatures and things get released into the atmosphere and then drift down onto the land and we don't normally encounter them. They don't normally maybe oh, yeah. reach the ground. I bet there are unknown species that live high in the sky that maybe yeah. are microscopic or very yeah. small. Absolutely. Um, and also, the Carmen line of space is like 60 miles up. So if you want mm. to really, really speculate, 
you could say that well you know just in the same way that we look at the oceans and we and we say there could be anything down there because it's such a vast area yeah. well the sky is such a vast area as well but I get what you're saying that you would think that you would see these things but I don't know like I, I, I don't know mm. about that I think that it's such a vast area that it's possible that you could have things way above where commercial flights move around you could theoretically have things up much higher than that and that maybe we wouldn't know much about them and maybe there would only be these random li- like when a giant squid washes up yeah exactly I would say within just the last 20 or 30 years I remember I don't know about you but I remember reading books about giant squid and they were at that point they were pretty much hypothetical but they said oh we think they do exist yeah because we found a suction cup uh-huh. or or you know we've, we've found some evidence but we, we don't know but now they know yeah these things exist and yeah. they even think there might be you know an octopus that might actually be a lot bigger than ones that they've already seen And but yeah one thing I will say yeah I think it's probably another one to file under folklore and exaggeration and misidentification interestingly to me I don't know if I've mentioned him on the podcast but there's a writer called L.A. Lewis mm-hmm. now there's a part of me Martin that would love for you and I to actually do what would be a very short run podcast at some point on this writer mm-hmm. I think I may even have spoken to you about it once a while ago he only wrote like 12 stories right it's a really tragic story he committed suicide and apparently he either burned all of his unpublished material or it was like in his will right that all that stuff should be burned so there's this book called The Tales of the Grotesque it's his only collected work first of all to any of our listeners that like really good fiction this guy is as good as anyone Mm -hmm. anyone out there at least in terms of imagination I think Martin you would love him I'll definitely check it out I'm, I'm right up for that he's something else and he needs to be more widely read because he has he's truly the width of imagination in his writings. Well, I've actually spoken to the guy who owns the copyright. Oh, really? Now, the copyright for Ellie Lewis's work will actually be up in a few years, but I initially, I did speak to him about trying to see if we could either do like a documentary or even do some readings on the channel of yeah. his stuff. Anyway, the reason I'm talking about Ellie Lewis is that he wrote a story so you've got the horror in the heights mm-hmm. the Conan Doyle story so there's this other story called Haunted Air okay and I think it's kind of along those lines sure and it segues into a topic that I've said that I would love for us to investigate for the podcast which is the gremlin folklore oh, from yeah, yeah. the second world war yeah because I, I thought when you were covering this I thought that's something that but these aren't these aren't large creatures you know these are yeah plus the, the gremlins would be small creatures that lived on the plains right that was the kind yeah. of like that was the kind of folklore yeah but the whole point is that there are recorded instances many recorded instances of pilots claiming that they saw things not just like the Foo Fighters that you were talking about, right. but actual creatures that came wow. into physical contact with their planes. I have no idea about that. No, that's really, really interesting. I'm definitely up for checking that out. The reason I bring that up as well is just to get back to the idea of the sky is vast. You've got to leave the door open for that. And I do like the idea, although I get what you're saying about, you know, you know, there's the idea of panspermia and things which would normally be on like asteroids and microbial life and asteroids or comets you're like embedded in ice and stuff though that's yeah you know is it possible that some of these things especially the stuff that floats down to the ground and then it dissolves is it possible that some of this is microbial maybe they're in spores they move around uh, in meteorites and things like that they burn up in the atmosphere but something manages to survive and then yeah like an invasion of the body snatchers yeah. yeah yeah But no, I think I think it's a fascinating topic, mate, and uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to you tell me all about it. I also kind of thought it raises the question a little bit: see wings as a means of flight? Not the band. <laughs> no, they're only the band. The Beatles wish they could have been. <laughs> wings are quite complex structures, so mm-hmm. they take a long time to evolve. They're costly in terms of energy to maintain them and fuel them to actually flap wings. You know. Yeah. You have to wonder if the first animals to have taken to the skies of the earth many hundreds of millions of years ago way you know way before the dinosaurs and you know like way 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 back maybe when life was still mostly just in the sea 
if the first thing is to evolve to take advantage of that environment, maybe to float above the ocean and avoid predators, if they might have used a solution as simple as a gas-filled sack to fly. Yeah, and there are spiders, aren't they? That in the yeah, they'll, they'll use they'll weave webs that, that allow them yeah, to fly. and I think not that long ago there was a an instance down in Mexico and people were taking video of mm. all this sort of silky material moving around through the sky, but apparently it's these spiders that cast their web out. Yeah, yeah, which I think kind of ties in a little bit with something I didn't really have time to bring up in this podcast and I won't get into it now, but like the angel hair phenomenon and, and that yeah. kind of thing. I wondered it though, if, if something like that did exist, like a, a kind of floating organism that used gas instead of wings to fly, if something like that did exist in Earth's distant past, would it really have left anything in the fossil record? How would we know? It's not going to get fossilised in its balloon form. It's going to burst. So That's a great point. I've heard biologists talking about that, mm-hmm. talking about how there are certain types of animal that there would be almost no record of them existing because they would be soft bodied essentially and I think only in like jellyfish for example I think there there are like some really rare like fossilised jellyfish but it has to be under very specific things but jellyfish look like aliens. They do know that jellyfish were really early really really early on. Yeah. So they're obviously in in volume enough that Although they're soft and, and hard to hard to fossilise, there's just so many of them in the sea that there were enough that did manage to meet those criteria to be fossilised. Yeah. There'll be things even more you know, even more tenuous than them and who knows. But Mike, I think I think the sun is coming up. Yes, it is. It might just be a giant sky jellyfish, but I think that's the sun. <laughs> or a Russian rocket test. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure. Great to be back, mate. Great to be back. Oh, and listeners as well. You lot as well. You're all right. Yes, thanks for eavesdropping. Mm-hmm.